visualize results and stuff that we get from our experiments so we don't have to deal with you know having lots of tables um, in it and so uh, I'll, I'll get into that book later um, so yeah that's pretty much the premise of uh, what we want to do here basically like like you were saying just like a, an introduction to what what you can do with R and with graphics and stuff like that and I think it's really helpful in it not only for presenting in papers but also just analyzing your own data yourself um, I think visualizing really helps even if you actually never put it in a paper um, so I give credit where it's due uh, Mike showed me most of the stuff I know about R, so <laughs> credit for him, and he, he helped a little bit with some of the plots and stuff on the on the presentation. So I'm just going to start with a, a little story to make it a little interesting and more fun for us here. So this is Bob, and he's a scientist. He's like us. He does lots of science. He likes, he gets lots of results, and, and he wants to analyze them. He wants to do something, and he wants to make an impact, so he wants to share these results with other people. So he wants to publish papers, right? And to do that, well, Bill is in his way. This is Bill. Bill is also a scientist, but he's a reviewer. So he likes science as well, but he doesn't like bad science. So he wants to make sure that no bad science ever gets into papers. Um, and uh, that's that's Bob's only only uh, problem with these papers. It has to be good. Otherwise, it's going to be rejected. So uh, one day, Bob did some science, and he's a taco scientist. So he comes up with new taco flavors, and he puts them, uh, and, and, and he makes them, and he gives them to people, and he asks them what they think. So uh, that's what he does here, and that's the data that we're going to look at today. And so this is a table that he put in his first paper. So you see it's a really big table. There's a bunch of numbers, right? So we'll have different fillings, you know, the traditional beef, chicken, steak, right? But he does some weird ones like frog and mango and the mystery meat. Um, and he asks different people in different age ranges, you know, kids 13 to 20, uh, you know, middle age, 21 to 30, and then 40 plus. And he also reports to average for each of these groups here. So this is a really big table. Right? It's hard to get information from it. It's hard to see what the best ratings are. It's hard to see what the trends are between different age groups or for, for different fillings and for different types. So maybe people like soft tacos or hard tacos or whatever. And so this can relate to lots of different uh, experiments or, or things that we do research with. Right, So it's very comparable. So um, basically Bill saw this table and he's like, nope, I don't like it. I can't understand it. So he sent it back. And that made Bob sad. So Bob had to figure out a way to do this. So this is what he did. He, he, he looked around. He said, how can I make this table better? Well, he found R. He found R to do that. And R can make this table better. So this is R. R is a letter, but it's also a programming language. It's uh, based on S, which was a statistical language developed a, a number of years ago. Um, but this is an open source, free software tool for uh, statistical modeling, machine learning, lots of different things. And it's getting a lot of momentum as well. They're, they're, people are putting in a lot of uh, regular programming features that weren't in it before to make it a more multi-purpose language and it's actually really convenient and it's really nice um, and our studio as well is very nice for statistical and scientific computing and analysis of data because it keeps all of your data together you can run scripts you can generate reports I actually made this slideshow in our studio um, you, basically it's it's markdown which is just HTML text formatting um, and you can mix in chunks of code in there uh, so it's very, it's very nice, it puts everything all together uh, and, and it just works well, especially for scientific computing. So first things first, uh, we'll just start a little bit with some brief R things. I'll send out this PowerPoint as well. Now I still have a document uh, that's not a PowerPoint, so it's easier to scroll through it so you can see all the code examples and, and different things. Um, so you don't have to memorize anything that's in here. So uh, the basic concept in R is a data frame, which is basically just a table. So you're taking like a CSV file or, or any other file, you can have lots of different formats and you bring it into a data frame. And so you'll have columns, you have rows, you know, you name your columns, they all have different values, they can be numeric and stuff. Can we bring uh, ARFF uh, from backup format into R? Yes, yeah, so there's, and what that's what's really nice about R is there's a bunch of different packages for anything you can imagine, and there's actually a package for reading ARFF files from Weka. Okay. There's even a package to use Weka from R. So you actually have Weka installed and you could actually call learners and different things from within R if you want to automate some experiments. But yeah, definitely. There's there's all kinds of things you can read from databases, you can write to a whole bunch of different places. So it's it's very convenient, yeah. Um, and, and, and I'll send out some information on that too yeah, afterwards uh, if you want. I would like to, to have that utility the way that it then allows us to uh, uh, convert from ARF to R basically. Absolutely, yeah, and you can do that, so. Very good. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so this knitter package is the K N I T R. This is this is actually what allows um, a, a lot of different you, to present 
R and stuff like that. So actually, Knitter is what constructed the slideshow for me. And so it, it just it's another package that you can use. Um, but basically, uh, I only loaded this library here so I can use this uh, cable function, which it uh, we're loading in our CSV here with this line. So we have a, a CSV file that pretty much holds those results. Um, and then we just want to preview it. So, I'll, so here's the output from those three lines of code. So we load our library so we have the functions that we need. Uh, and then we do this uh, read.csv file here to read in our CSV file. And then we just, we just do head and, and view the top four rows, which is what this is doing. So, so we can see how this is outlined. So it's very similar to how we'll see some of our results. So we'll have, uh, so basically it's not formatted the same way as that table, but this is formatted in a way that when you run experiments, this is how you get it, right? So you have different kinds of, you know, taco shells and the different fillings and different age groups and then the rating for that. So you have a bunch of different combinations of these first three columns. And then each one has this, uh, per, uh, the, the y variable, the dependent variable, it's just the value that you're looking at. So basic, you know, basic things would be A, U, C, you know, for us. Um, and so there's a bunch of rows here. This one has like 130 rows, just different combinations of all the things that were in that table. I mean, you don't really have to understand, it's just a toy data set, just for fun. Um, so to follow along, once you get this, you can download the CSV file and, and use it. Um, and there's a bunch of packages like I said, that are available in R, so the, very easy to uh, install them. You just call install.packages with the package name. And I'll give a brief demo of R Studio and stuff so you can see how all that works. Um, so just, just keep all this stuff in, in your mind and you can come back to this later. So first thing um, Bob wanted to do was just to see just the beef tacos. So there's a bunch of different fi fillings. So he wanted to just see the results for the beef ones. So to do that, there's another library called dplyr. Um, and it just allows you to manipulate data frames very easily. So it, it's almost in a, a similar syntax to, to or what you'll be familiar with with SQL or, or just common language things for what you want to do with data frames. So for instance, uh, we take our, the original results file and we only want beef fillings. So we say filter where the filling equals beef. And so that gives you another data frame with only rows that have filling of beef. And so we'll see that here. So now, our first example only had this, but there were, all, so there were a bunch of rows. to select a state. Similar, yeah. So, what it does, yeah. so it's a select statement with a, like a where clause, right? Where filling equals beef. So it's a very similar thing. And that link on there will help kind of put those things together and show you a bunch of different ways to, to manipulate data frames. Um, and then if you wanted to just get the average rating for that, you just say mean. And then you have your data frame here. And then to access a column in a data frame is this uh, dollar sign operator. So I say beef ratings, dollar sign rating will give me a, a vector with all of the ratings. And then the mean is going to take the average of all of those ratings. In this case is 0.85, right? So it's a pretty good rating, right? Uh, and so that's kind of, that's kind of where it's, it's pretty much going to be it for as far as manipulating data frames. For us, we, we really are concerned about visualization, right? So Bob's first figure. So, R has base graphics packages that are very simple and quick to use, but they don't produce nice graphs. They're just a very, very basic, I just want to see a distribution really fast. But what, what this package that we're going to use today is called ggplot2, um, and it's, it's a very nice package. It's very easy to understand, and it's very standardized. So basically all you do is you always start with this ggplot function, and you give it, um, you give it your data frame right here, and then you say AES, which stands for aesthetic, just for different aesthetic aspects. So for us, uh, we want the X value to represent the age group. We want the Y value to be the rating, which for us, most of the time, the Y value is going to be the rating. Um, and then we want to color it by the fill type. And it's just going to be easier if I show you the results here. So, so this is just for uh, loading the library. And so we call ggplot here. This is before any graph. So we're saying, this is my data frame I'm giving. This is only the beef ratings. We're saying x value should be the age group, so we'll see across here that x value is age group. Um, the y value is the rating over here. And then we're filling, which is the color, the fill color by shell type. So we'll see that the red ones are the hard shells, and then the blue ones are the soft shells. And then this geom bar is just indicating a bar graph. Uh, the stat equals identity is saying that I want my y values to be the actual values. Uh, I want the height of the bar to re represent the actual value, so the actual rating. Um, in some cases, it'll do a count, like a histogram, and that's why you have to specify that initially. And then this position dodge is saying put the two bars next to each other rather than a stacked bar graph. Um, and again, th there's a bunch of documentation over across all of this. This book uh, you know, describes how to use everything. 
Um, so you don't have to remember any of these commands now. And so um, this R Graphics cookbook is actually all completely online. Um, it's nice having the book because you can just flip through it and see different graphs that you want to you want to do. And a lot of these examples I took from here. So you see I have these little notes and it's like, okay, I want to do a histogram. So I'll flip to the histogram chapter and see how that works. Or I want to do a, a bar graph or, or a scatter plot or whatever. Um, and even if you just Google like scatter plot, GG plot, the chapter from this book will come up online. The whole thing's online. So um, it's really useful. So like I said, you never have to really remember all the, the parameters and the arguments for using these things. Um, so and it, and it can do a lot more than even I know how to do, and it's really powerful. So, um, so a couple more examples. So let's say Bob's feeling really good. He's like, yeah, I did one graph, so now I want to see everything. So uh, to see multiple plots within one figure, you can use these facets. So basically a facet is just saying put multiple plots in the same thing faceted by a certain variable. So let's say that he wanted, so this is back to the original results now. So we have that big original table, not just the beef ones, for every, every kind of taco filling possible. So again, the X is going to be the age group, the Y is the rating, the fill is the shell type. So same thing. So I want this bar graph, same exact bar graph, but this time I'm going to facet it by the filling. So that's saying for every single filling I had, we had like 12 or something like that, I want to see a bar graph of it. So that's the result here. And you got to be careful with facets because this doesn't make much sense. This is almost as bad as that table, right? There's too much going on here. You can't really see what's happening. There's a, a lot here because you have a lot of levels of this particular factor, this filling factor. There's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 19, fact, uh, 19 levels of the factor. So it's hard to see. So, you know, he got a little too ambitious. So we're going to step back and we're going to look at other ways to do this, right? So the first things first is a very basic histogram. And this helps just to see the distribution of the data. For instance, this will show if all of the ratings were just one, or if all of the ratings were zero, or you know where did the ratings go. So uh, we just give it, again, this is always, always, always going to be the same, this very first part, is that we're just giving our data frame here. And then we're saying for histograms, you only have the one x value, which is going to be rating. And then we want a histogram with the bin width of 0.01. And basically, you're just going to play with the bin width to, to see you know the size. So the size of this rectangle is the width of that. So if it's bigger, you're going to get a less detailed histogram. If the, if the bin width is smaller, you can get a more detailed histogram. So we, we can see that there's a little bit of trends here. So most of the ratings fall between 0.8 and 1, uh, although some of them center around 0.6, and there's a couple stragglers in the middle. And so that helps you uh, just see, like, okay, the results are, you know, spread out a little bit. It makes sense that there's this distribution. And if you're expecting your values to have a certain distribution and they don't, then that means that's a problem. But for us, the ratings seem okay. You know, most people are nice and they don't rate at zero, and so... Uh, this is good. And so this is all of the ratings. We didn't, we didn't facet it. We didn't group it by anything. Uh, we just wanted to see what all of the ratings look like. So all right. OK, that's good. So uh, we can move on here. So the next is a, a horizontal bar chart. So since, uh, since we have a lot of uh, levels in the uh, filling factor, when you put it on the x-axis, it's going to be hard to see it. So what we do is we do a bar chart, um, and we do it horizontally. So I'll just, I'll just walk through the code here. So again. Um, so in this case, x is going to be filling, um, which since we flip it with this coordinate flip here, um, this starts off as the x-axis. So x is filling here. The y is rating. So if you were to turn this 90 degrees the other way, it would be hard to read the labels on the x-axis. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason we flip it. And so again, it's just a bar graph we do um, just with different, different colors this time. Um, and we change the theme a little bit just so the text is bigger right here and so the background is white just to make it a little bit easier to read um, and by default when you have this uh, fill argument it's going to add a legend on the side just like we saw uh, here it added this legend um, but for our case the legend would be redundant because it would just show all of these values so uh, we just hide it here um, how did you make it rather than like this it's going to be uh, the chord flip right here so basically, oh, okay. so since, see how X is filling, and, and in this case it's Y, so basically you're setting it up like it was the other way, and then you're just saying, flip uh -huh. it. And then in my case, I'm setting the Y limit to 0.8, from 0.8 to 0.875, because as you see, they don't even start changing until about here. Otherwise, it would go from zero all yeah. the way up, and it'd be just a lot of extra information that you don't need. So uh, technically, I could have put in some code there to infer it automatically, but I was kind of lazy, so, or Bob was kind of lazy. <laughs> all right, so next, um, so... To do this, usually you're going to be generating multiple figures within one script, like for one paper. And you're going to want them to have the same theme. So to do that, so, so you see this theme BW I have, which is just black-white for a very basic theme, and the, the base text size is 18. 
And so all we're, all we're saying is here is for every single figure I do from now on, just give it that theme so I don't have to do it every single time. And, and that's all that is. And this is what I'll usually do for most of my figures. But you can play around with it. There's a bunch of different themes. And again, this is just an introductory thing for, for you to dig into later. Um, so box plots. So box plots help with distributions. You know, histograms are very basic, just what's the distribution of it, but box plots help show the, the minimum, maximum, deviations, quartiles, and everything. Um, so if you notice, we're going to go back to the table real quick. Um, and so you see how everything here is just descriptive stats. So these are the actual results from, for, for this part. But here you have average, standard deviation, range, minimum. You could have maximum, median, whatever. Um, all of this, this whole entire section could be summarized in a box plot. And so that's what we're going to do here. Rather than having to calculate for each, for each thing and having people reading and seeing the numbers, you can actually do a, a box plot. And so that's what this is right here. So we're saying again, talk of results, right? X is filling, Y is rating, um, but, but we're flipping the coordinates, so that's why it's on the Y axis again. So we're filling, it's the same exact thing, but except this time we're doing geo box plot. And I say alpha just because the colors are very harsh, so I give it some transparency, uh, just so it's not very, because these are bright colors, just so it wasn't so bright. Um, that's a basic thing. And uh, we're going to facet it by the hard and soft. So we're going to have two plots. One, this is only, so this is only hard tacos with the different fillings. Uh, so age group isn't considered here. And then this is the soft tacos with the fillings. So you see that the, they tend to have very similar distributions, but you'll notice that there are more outliers in the low ratings for hard tacos. Uh, for the soft tacos, right? So the, the the box plot is the the this line is is the average. The first line here is the first quartile, and the n is the third quartile. Uh, you know, maximum, minimum, and then outliers that are greater than three three halves of a standard deviation, right? Um, and I had to look that up, so I didn't really, I didn't know what that. I just know box plots show what the things are. I didn't know what the details were, um, so it's easy to look up. Um, and so, but something's still missing, right? So I said we didn't consider age groups here. So we want to be able to, so the thing is, is that when you run experiments, there's usually multiple factors and they all have multiple levels. So it really takes a lot of creativity to make a good figure. And it's hard to make a good figure. And I think that's why people don't do it sometimes because the table will show, one thing about a table is it shows all the results, right? So if you really wanted to go and look and track all the numbers and maybe draw some lines, you could see every single factor. But nobody's going to really do that by just looking at a table. So it, it does take time. And I think sometimes a good figure will take a few hours to make, but I think it's worth it because then... Somebody can re scroll through a paper and they see that figure and it summarizes the whole thing. It makes them want to read the rest of the paper. Um, so right now, so we don't see age groups. We don't see all of our factors. So we're going to play around a little bit more to kind of check out different factors. And the thing is, is you're not really going to have one plot that summarizes all of your data. You're going to have different plots based on different factors that you're looking at. So uh, the first thing is, is really nice is this jitter function. So if we were to do a scatter plot, or just a regular scatter plot of this by age group, we would just see straight lines here because this x value isn't continuous. So all we would see is a bunch of dots along this, this line, a bunch of dots along this line, a bunch of dots around here. But what jitter does is it just moves them around a little bit. So it keeps them within their groups, but it moves them around so you can see where the different points are. So this is really helpful because what it does is we can visualize that, okay, for less than 13, they tend to rate things very high. For 40 plus, they tend to rate things very low, and it really doesn't matter what the shell type is. So it's something interesting that we're going to, that's a trend that we're going to see throughout some of, a lot of these graphics. And so again, to do that, very basic, it's almost the same as what we've been doing. The X in this case is the age group. We're going to color by shell type, and then we just say jitter, and the size is just the size of the dots. Um, in this case, we're not looking at fillings, so it just doesn't matter what the filling is. Um, but like I said, it's, you can't really visualize everything in one graph. So next up is density curves. These are really nice um, because it's kind of like histograms, it, but what it does is it does a kernel density estimation over the distribution of your data. So it's just like a smooth histogram, basically, is how I like to think of density curves. And what we do here is we overlay them. Um, so we're filling by age group. So we're, we have four different density curves here, and we're over, overlaying them on top of each other, and we introduce some transparency so we can see the ones that overlap like this. So we'll see that 40 plus, like we saw before, is they have low ratings. They don't really overlap much, even though they have a, um, they overlap here. And then, and as a, as the, the the age group less than 13, they have very high ratings. So we can see that uh, density curves are very nice, especially when you have multiple distributions of data that you want to look at. Um, so similar to that, we have a violin plot, and all that does is it takes it takes a, it takes this density curve, 
it flips it on its side and then it mirrors it. So you'll see that, see, look at, just follow, focus on this purple one right here. You'll see that this purple is similar, uh, but it just mirrors that. And so what violin plots do is it, it switches the axis and it allows you to, to just basically see the distributions a little bit better. So now we can see that these two age groups overlap a little bit, whereas these two don't overlap at all, which is a little bit harder to see in this density plot. Just again, it's another way and it's, a lot of times it's preference and it depends on your data. So what, usually what you'll do is you'll try all of these things with your data and see what looks best and describes it best. And like I said, a lot of times you won't be publishing all of these figures, but you'll be using it yourself just to see it. And what's nice is that like, as you do things, you tend to build up your own library of how you do things and how your experiments tend to work. And so all you have to do is plug in the new data sets. So at the beginning, it's hard because the learning curve is tough. And it took me a, you know, a couple months to really grasp my, you know, get my mind around R and to like it and all that stuff. But uh, it tends to be useful as you use it more. So uh, line graphs are, are good, especially when you have continuous x variables. Um, and so this lets you track performance or ratings across time or across a different variable. So that's what we're going to do here. So uh, the code's not on it because it's a big plot. So basically, same thing. I say x is age group, y is rating. Um, I group by shell type um, and then color by shell type. Um, I won't get into why we need this group. The book actually does. Um, but basically, it's when you have a line plot, you need to group by something so it knows how to draw the lines and connect them. So what we'll do is we'll get, we'll get lines, but we also want the points. So we're going to see the points and the lines together. Um, and then we're faceting by filling. This is just some theme stuff to make it fit on the chart. Um, but again, the code details you can look at later. So basically, we're looking at every single filling type, and we have two different colors for each shell type, and we have x values for the age group. So this is this is visualizing every single factor we have, and it's and it's a big plot. It is, but what's very useful about this is you're not going to go and look at every single individual thing, but you can actually see that they're almost all the same. So it really doesn't matter what filling it is. The younger people just like whatever food you give them, <laughs> and the older people are just pickier. You know, that's what we see from our data here. And so this is even useful, and uh, I think this would be good, especially when there's more variation in, in these points. This would be something very good to put in a paper, especially when you're tracking across increasing values. You know, you have different data sets or, or, or sizes of different things, um, especially if they're different, because then you can start picking out individual things that are outliers or that perform better or that perform worse. And uh, what's, what's interesting about here is that this is a categorical variable, right, the A's group. So technically, you shouldn't be doing a line graph because it's categorical. Lines are for when you can track things across time or it's continuous. So, okay, fine. We don't want, it to, we don't want, to, we don't want to put a line graph in because we don't want people to say you're doing your math wrong. Okay, okay, fine. But what's nice about ggplot is that there's lots of different options. So now we're going to do a heat map. So it's the same exact thing. We're saying, I, I should have said x equals age group, y equals filling, but it just does that automatically. Um, and then this geome tile basically tiles and it colors it by the ratings. Um, and it says it sets the base color to white. And then it fills it with a gradient from white to this blue, so starting from white to blue, and then it facets by shell type. So again, we can see this heat map is that the darker colors are better ratings, the lighter colors are, are, are light ratings, and it's, it's very nice, it's very appealing, it's a very nice graph in four lines of code. Technically it's one line of code, but it doesn't fit all together. Four lines of code. And um, it's really interesting that it doesn't depend on, it doesn't matter what the, the taco shell is, it doesn't matter what the filling is, the ratings just go down as the age increases. So that sounds like a biased experiment to me, right? And so, it, so nothing changes, so that's interesting. Maybe Bob isn't a very good scientist. So uh, we only have a couple more. So, uh, so the la basically our last bit here is when we do experiments with lots of factors, of course we want to do a NOVA. We want to do some HSD tests and we want to plot. And uh, R makes that very, very, very easy. It makes I mean, it's written as a, t a statistical language. So um, I'm not going to go into all the statistics. Actually, Mike did a presentation for a class where he did that, and that's what this link is. Um, so you guys can check that out if you want to. Um, but for ANOVA, it's really easy. It's a few lines of code, and then to plot it, it's another few lines of code. So uh, I'm going to break all this. I'm going to break all this down in the next couple slides. Um, just one thing to note is that these are the average. So, so there's one rating per, per observation. For us, we're going to have like 10 iterations or 20 iterations. And so you're going to want to use those original results for the ANOVA. For the graphs, you're going to average all the iterations together, right? And then you're going to plot that. But for the ANOVA, you want the, the, you want the differences. In this case, I didn't have that. So it's, it's, I mean, it still works, but it's not real good statistics. So just, just a disclaimer. Um, so the first things first is we use this library. I don't know how to pronounce that, but we use that library to do the ANOVA. 
Um, actually, I think it's for the HSD. I don't think you need. I don't think you need it for the ANOVA actually. Um, yeah. So basically, to do ANOVA, you just say AOV. Uh, rating is our dependent variable. It's our Y variable. And then we just put this tilde here. We, you, you always do that. I don't. I don't really know why, but you just do it. And so we want to see the interaction between shell type and age group. You could have just given it one factor if you just wanted a, a one factor ANOVA, but we wanted to do some interactions. And then we just say our, our data frame. In this case, this shouldn't be the results. It should have been what the original results are, what the iterations, but again, this is just a, an, an explanation. So we just say summary with that ANOVA variable, and it gives you the ANOVA, and it's really great. So, and it even gives you the significance at different levels. So with three stars, it means it's significant to 100%. A lot of times you'll see three stars or two stars or, or, or one or whatever, and it'll just tell you automatically. You don't even have to go and change off of value or whatever. So we'll see that shell type and age group by themselves are significant, but together they're not. The interaction between them is not. So uh, HSD now. Um, so we're going to do hsd.test, which is the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function out of that, that library. We're going to give it our ANOVA variable. And we're going to say, OK, we want to compare age groups with 95% confidence. And it actually outputs a little bit more than this. It gives you all the means and, and minimums and maximums, but it didn't fit on the slide. So this is what we're concerned about. It's the groups, right? So we'll see that there are no overlapping groups with age groups. And so as we saw in our other plots is, there are very distinct trends for each age group, and we can see here that those trends are statistically significant. So every age group is in a different group, uh, and it's statistically proven. So that's good. And so now you just have to call, call a couple different functions um, to actually plot the HSD. And so that's why uh, uh, it's really you're going to take this code and you're going to put in your variables. Um, but to explain it is this is a different HSD function from that library that uh, it's going to take the ANOVA, confidence level 95, and it puts it into a data frame. Um, by age group, and then you give it row names. Um, I can explain all that later. It's 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 complicated now. You can see it. But then what this allows you to do is you give it to ggplot, and all these different variables is uh, this last line of code generated that in the data frame. And I can show you actually a real example of this if you guys want to see it. Um, but basically, I, I, for me, actually, I made a function that does this ggplot thing for myself. So every time I want to see an HSD test, I just call I call it like ggplot HSD, and I just made it myself. And, I just call it every time. So now you can see the interaction, right? So 40 plus in the 21 to 39. And so you can see the HSD plot here. And then you could even limit it. If you don't want to see all of these, you could use that filter uh, function that we saw earlier to filter it to only the ones that you want to show. So you have a big one, right? So we'll see, OK, these two aren't significant. So maybe we'll exclude a couple of them. And we only want to show these three or whatever. Um, but it's interesting to see, though, is that the difference is all not 0. So the difference is all significant here. So the zero isn't shown on the graph, but they're all negative. So since we're comparing the difference in means, there is a difference and none of them are zero. So that means it goes back to our groups here that they're all in a different group and they're all statistically significant. So that's a very, very, very fast, quick intro into plotting with R. Again, there's a lot more that can be done here. Um, but basically, Bob took his paper back to Bill to finish off the story. He put in some nice graphs and he got it accepted. Yay, Bob. So. Moral of the story is use figures in your paper and, and people will like it.